Here we go. All right, so my name is Victoria Collins. I'm an instructional technologist for the Center for Instructional Technology. And thank you so much for joining me today for one of our newer workshops on Adobe Portfolio and learning how to create portfolios for any academic subject. Um, I want to let you know that we're going to keep this super casual. It looks like there's three other people on the call. Two right now, looks like someone hopped off. So two people on the call. So I want you guys to know that you're welcome to um, come off mute, ask me questions throughout the workshop. Um, if you have thoughts or maybe you've already used a portfolio and you have questions, please feel free to ask me those specific questions, either uh, verbally or you can comment in the chat. If you're new to Teams, there is a chat icon either at the top or the bottom of your window. I'll be checking that um, about halfway through the the workshop and then at the very end of the workshop and we can capture those questions there. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Again, today we're going to talk about creating portfolios for any academic subject. In this workshop, we're going to do a couple of things. First, I want to show you all examples of how UA students are currently using portfolio for their classwork. So I have a great example of a grad student that I'm going to share with you. <clears throat> We're going to discuss steps for incorporating the use of portfolio in your classroom because um, here at CIT, we understand that one of the most important parts about using technology in the classroom is having it built into your rubric or having a plan for instructing and using it in the classroom. And then finally, I'm going to do a very basic dive into using portfolio and how to get started. Um, this workshop is not going to teach you how to use the tool fully at 100 percent, but it's going to give you enough information um, so you can go in and start playing with the tool and using it before incorporating it into your classroom. All right, so first off, let's get started. What is a Debbie Portfolio? If you're not familiar with the tool, a Debbie Portfolio is a tool that's a part of the Debbie Creative Cloud. It allows users to build websites with minimum effort. So not like Weebly or WordPress, but it has the same idea and the same purpose of giving faculty and students and even staff here at UA the ability to create a website, a portfolio that has multiple pages with multiple links and being able to publish it themselves with a custom URL. Now, because we all have access to the Creative Cloud for free through the university, this tool is going to be free for all faculty, staff, and students who should never run into an issue with having to pay to use this tool in its entirety. It's all free. So let me go ahead and show you an example. I'm going to take my face off the screen and I'm going to share my screen with you so we can talk about some examples of portfolio. I'm going to share my screen. All right, so everyone should be able to see my screen now. If you can't, let me know. Um, you should see an example of a portfolio. All right, so this is going to be just a very, very basic portfolio design. What you're seeing now is by no means um, any uh, proof of limitations that you can do with portfolio. So portfolio was actually created for um, creatives, industry creatives, to be able to showcase creative work, but it's quickly called on with um, in the education, higher education, for people to use for portfolios, for classwork, for showcasing research or projects or work they're doing inside and outside the classroom. Um, first, you see here this example I've created. You have a landing page. If you click on View My Portfolio, you have a very simple layout here. Um, you can do two different two specific things in portfolio. You can create a single page, which is what you see here. This is just a page with content. You can add images, forms, buttons, super simple. And then you also have something called a collection page. And we'll talk about this at the end of this workshop whenever we kind of log into portfolio and look at things. But a collection page is basically a page where you can have multiple pages all linked from one area. It's kind of an umbrella page. You also can do things like link to outside links. So if you need to link to another website, you can do that. Um, portfolio is so easy and super intuitive for our students. Um, some of the features that Portfolio offers is elegant layouts. The, el the layouts are pre-built, so you're not having to build a build the template or layout. Um, it's flexible, custom, and responsive design. So all of the templates and the themes that you pick in portfolio are going to be responsive for tablets, cell phones, or uh, machines, computers. You can create custom URLs. There's live editing. So unlike WordPress and Weebly, where you have to edit 
in an editing panel or on a dashboard and then you have to go back and view your page, you actually can edit in what feels like real time. So you're seeing your changes happen in person or on the same screen. And then there's also password protection. So some of the questions we have from instructors and from students um, about portfolio is I don't want the things that I'm publishing to be live for the world to see. So portfolio, once you publish, it is live, it's published in the web, but there's ways to prevent Google and other sites from crawling your portfolio so it doesn't show up in search. But there's also ways to password protect pages and password protect your entire portfolio. So if you have students that are sharing content, maybe they don't want to be shared with anyone other than you, they can assign passwords and give those passwords to you so you can be the only person to log into that page or to their site. And again, this tool is super easy and intuitive. In the past, we've uh, walked whole classes through using portfolio, and we have found mid-semester that most of the students don't even come back for a check-in um, or for questions, uh, a question and answer sessions on portfolio because it's just super intuitive and easy to use. All right, so let's go ahead and look at an example of a real student at UA, a grad student, and how um, they're using portfolio for their work. So again, this is a landing page. This landing page is optional, um, but our student here, Alana, she's allowed us to use her portfolio. She has a landing page. If I click on enter the website, you can see how she simply has her site structured. So her site is being used for showcasing the work that she's doing inside and outside the classroom. This was a portfolio she created for a class or for a course she was in. Um, but you can easily see she has some different sections broken down for us, education, service, teaching, research, and so on. Um, those are in her navigation menu, but she also has them here linked with personal pictures. So I'm just going to click on one. Let's click on education. And then you can see it takes us to a page where she talks about her education. We're going to talk about next, like how do you incorporate portfolio in the classroom, some things to think about. Um, so I know because I've spoken with Alana that um, these sections were required by her instructor, instructor. So she had the creative freedom to make her portfolio look as how she wanted to, but she had to follow some really specific guidelines on what type of content she was sharing. But this is her portfolio. Um, it's really neat. It's really simple and easy to navigate and easy to build. You can see there's page, super simple links. All right. I'm just going to go back to our homepage while we keep talking. Does anybody have any questions so far? No? Okay, good deal. All right. So the biggest question we get as an instructor, how can I incorporate Adobe Portfolio into, my, into the classroom? Super simple. We have a couple of um, steps that our office has come up with to help you do this. And I'm going to share with you a rubric and a syllabus from an instructor who used this last fall in their classroom. First of all, determine the purpose of your portfolio. Um, as I mentioned, this tool can do a lot of different things. This tool can showcase creative work. Um, this tool can be used to um, ask students to learn a new technology, but also this tool can be used to showcase very specific things that you're trying to accomplish in your course. So determine what the purpose of your portfolio is first and what the purpose is for your students. Um, something else to mention with the portfolio tool, your students can build up to five sites for free. Well, you and the students can build up to five sites. That's five different sites with multiple pages, multiple layers. Um, so maybe you want your students to build a site for your specific class, or maybe you want your students to build a site that they can then use for the, you know, the continuation of their education here in Alabama. And then even outside of that is a larger portfolio. Just something to think about. Secondly, identify the learning outcomes that portfolio will address. Um, do we want this to be a tool to showcase the work that's happening inside and outside of the classroom? Um, do we want this tool to be used to capture maybe an internship or work that they're doing as a requirement outside of the classroom? Um, I mentioned earlier, we've had instructors that use this tool simply to prove that students are using new technologies, right? So that portfolio would look very different. They'd have a lot more freedom creating that portfolio than an instructor who's trying to capture um, certain content that they're required to use for their classroom. So just identify the learning outcomes of the portfolio. Next, decide what students will include in their portfolio. Um, so through trial and error with a couple of instructors, I I have realized <laughs> from a health perspective that it is better if students have um, a guideline on what they're supposed to include on their portfolio. So it's easier for you to assign this tool to be used if you can say, all right, I need you to cover 
your education, service, teaching, or research, or maybe it's going to be, um, you know, your journaling projects, and then one um, self-taught lesson that you've done at home. Um, so anything that you can think of to give your students a little more structure on what they're supposed to include, I think the easier it is for those students to um, to build their portfolio. Finally, identify and develop the scoring criteria, um, i.e. the rubric, to judge the quality of the portfolio. And again, this goes back to that first question, you know, how do you want or what do you want this portfolio to do for your students? Um, I'm going to show you an example of an instructor's syllabus. You'll see a lot of things are blanked out, um, but a syllabus that an instructor created for including portfolio in their classroom. And you can see course learning objectives, creating a portfolio is one of the learning objectives because not only did this instructor want the students to do the work in the classroom, but a big part of that was learning how to use an online tool to create a website to showcase that work. Um, they address a W portfolio in their late work section because it is a huge part of this course. Um, they give some information and our office can help you with all of this. If you need some more information about a W portfolio to include into your syllabus, we can help you there. I'm gonna scroll down to keep going to the rubric here. All right, so um, evaluations and grading. So this instructor broke down um, portfolio in the rubric a couple of different times, and I'll tell you why and how they did this. Um, because we understand at the CIT that it's, you know, maybe this is not a tool that you need to learn in full depth. Um, we are offering any class who wants to use portfolio in the classroom, we can set up a um, virtual or in-person session where I actually come in and teach portfolio to your students. And that's what we did with this instructor. Um, so part of this was we did a session, they had a join, and then they had some assignments on creating that first portfolio because they wanted their students to create the portfolio um, early on in the semester. So when they came to, got to the end of the semester and they actually had to post the content, we already knew that we had learned how to use portfolio. We have had one created with the URL established that we've shared with the instructor. So we have the space to put all of our content. Um, and you can see that was here, create, publish, and share portfolio, 10 points. Um, and then if you get on here, you see that a large part of their grade um, was actually their portfolio because this is where they shared all the content, all the things that they created throughout the year. Um, so you see a couple of different things here. These are more content related to the different things they're posting. But then they wanted pictures. So personalized pictures, that was 10 points, pictures that they had to post into their portfolios, grammar, spelling, and mechanics. And then this was mandatory to pass the class. So um, they weren't so worried about the look of the portfolio that everything had to be UA branded um, or anything like that. But you can see how they broke this down. If anyone needs an example of this, I'm, I'm happy to share this with you so you can have a, a better idea once we end the call on how to include this into your rubric. Awesome. Any questions? Let me just check the chat real quick. OK. No chat yet. All right. So we've talked about how students are using this portfolio. I showed you a very simple example and then we talked about the rubric. Um, I want to reiterate, we are here to help. Um, you know, we do not expect you to have to teach this tool to your students. I think it is a great idea for instructors to have a portfolio that they built maybe as an example of what they're looking for um, from their class. But we are here to host one on one sessions specifically for your course. Um, you can include that maybe in dates on your syllabus. If it's important for you, we can you know work with you to create those things so we can teach your students how to use this tool. And then also the IT service desk, if you're not familiar, um, all of our students, faculty instructors have access to the IT service desk. So our students can call with questions about their portfolio and they'll be rerouted to us and CIT. So you don't even have to answer questions about technical aspects of the portfolio. Um, they can just email the IT service desk and those will be rerouted to me probably. So let's go ahead and talk about how to access portfolio. So portfolio is an online tool. Um, unlike many of the tools in the creative cloud, um, you will not download anything to use portfolio. So your students can actually create their portfolio from any device, cell phones, laptops, tablets, um, and they can do that on multiple devices. So they're not having to actually download a tool to use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a new tab in my browser. I can actually access portfolio from any browser, so Firefox, um, Safari, any browser that I'm using. First step, I'm going to go to portfolio.adobe.com. 
whoops, I'm logged in. I'm sorry. Let me go ahead and log out so you can see that work a little differently. Um, but I'm going to go to portfolio.adobe.com and you're going to see this sign in icon. Now, all of our faculty and our students are going to be signing in the same way. I'm going to click sign in. And it's important for you to know this is probably one of the most important steps of accessing portfolio is that you're always going to want to use your at Crimson if you're a student or at UA email address if you're an instructor. Why? Because those are our email addresses that are associated with our Creative Cloud license at UA and that's how we're going to log in and access the unlimited features of portfolio. If I log in with a personal email address, I might get a free version, but it's not going to be that full robust version that I actually want to use with my Creative Cloud license. So I'm going to be logging in with the UA email address today because I'm not a student. I'm going to click continue. And because I've been logged in before, it's not going to reroute me, but it should um, do a single sign on where you're having to sign in through my Bama. All right, so once you log in, this may look a little different for you if you've never created a portfolio. So if you have a portfolio, I mentioned you can create up to five. When you first log in, you're going to come to a landing page with all of your portfolios. If you have never created a portfolio, you're probably going to come to a page that just asks you to create a new site. So what I'm going to do for today's purpose, I'm just going to create a new site. And this second step is where we should all be on the same page if you're following along with me. <clears throat> so this is where we pick our template. Unfortunately, there is no UA branded template that has been you know, preloaded into portfolio that we can access. This is something that we have worked with Adobe on and we still are working with Adobe on that. Um, but right now we can only choose from these templates. Um, all these templates are very different. They're all really I think they're really beautiful and they're seamless and they're pretty, um, but they're different. So one thing you might want to think about when you're setting up the use of portfolio in your classroom is do you want your students to all use the same template or are you going to allow them to use different templates? Some of these templates are very different. Um, I know instructors in the past that have done it both ways. The syllabus that I showed you, that instructor actually all requested that her students use this template, which is what I'm going to use today, but that's just a preference for you when it comes to grading and how you want these portfolios to look. So let's go ahead and pick this Mercedes template. This is just a preview to show you what this template is going to look like um, in different forms because it is responsive. So I'm going to decide to pick this. So I'm going to click on use this theme. All right, so I picked my theme and this is where I'm actually going to edit my portfolio. I mentioned earlier portfolio is unique and I prefer it this way than other tools like Weebly or WordPress and then I'm going to do some live editing. So um, well, I guess it's not actually live editing because it's not published but I can see edits in real time. So um, really quickly this is your navigation panel for all of your editing. Anything that you do here is going to translate here so you can see it. You see as I roll over different sections I have these blue icons these icons here are going to give me the same editing options as if I were clicking here on this editing panel. All right, so um, you will see this in your pages throughout your editing process. You'll never go to like a back page where you have to pick things. Everything that you do in portfolio is saved in real time, so you're not going to have to save your edits. Um, they will save in real time, so I could actually make edits, exit out of this window, pull it back up, and all those edits will be there. But my site is not published and changes aren't live until I click publish site. So I can make edits for two weeks, um, come back every time, see those edits, but they will not be live until I click publish site, right? So this is my publish site icon. All right now that we went over a few basics um, and we're in Adobe Portfolio Editor, I want to show you how to begin building your site. So the things I'm going to go over, they're going to be pretty high level. We're not going to dive too deep, but I want you to have a good understanding of how easy it is to use this tool and how it works. Um, so you can go back and maybe get started building a portfolio. First, let's talk about the anatomy of a portfolio website. So your portfolio websites are basically built around two types of pages. You have collection pages which you can see here in my portfolio, all portfolios are automatically assigned with a work page and a contact page. This work page is what we call a collection page. Let me go back to this example and show you. A collection page is that umbrella page where I talked about you could have one page with links out to other pages that live inside of your portfolio. And then you have a single page. A single page is just what it is. It's a single page. You can add content. Um, you can link from this page to other things. Um, but it's just a single page that lives on its own. 
those are the two types of pages, right? So that those that's the basics of building your portfolio is knowing that you have those two types of pages and you can add content to them. Let's go over here to your navigation panel. Um, when I first started using portfolio, I'll be honest, this panel drove me crazy because I was not used to seeing editing features on the left side of my screen. Um, things changed around in my mind, but now that I've used it, you know, after the first time I got used to it. Um, all right, so really quickly, you're going to see a couple of different sections here. If you can see those lines in between, the first is this essentials section. This section will stay on the editing panel throughout the process of you editing your your website. Um, we'll go, we'll dive into some of these in a minute, but I just want you to see there's an essentials section. You have this site wide section. So these are edits. This is going to stay anytime you change a page, this will stay here uh, for editing, but this is your site wide editing feature. So things like your header, your logo, navigation and footer. Again, we'll dive into that in a few minutes, but this will stay here. This third section, this will change depending on what kind of page or what page you're on. So this section is specific for editing just the page that you're on. You can see here it says this collection because I'm on a collections page. But if I click on contact, you can see here, if I scroll down to the third section, this is this page. So if I'm ever on an individual page and I just want to edit the, a single page, I will go to this third section and edit that there. Um, but the rest will all be site-wide edits, right? All right, so let's go back to my collections page. I want to show you how to add a page before we learn how to edit a page. Super simple. If I click on pages here under this essential section, I'm going to see this pop out. It's going to show me all the pages that I've built out in my site. All right. Before adding a page, I want to talk to you a little bit more about how you can edit each. The title and the links for each page. Um, so here you can see this work. This is a collections page. I know this is a collections page because it has this waffle grid icon here. So that grid icon symbolizes to me it's a collections page. I'm going to have multiple pages that live under this work umbrella. And then contact is a single page as a single page icon. Um, this is so cool. Uh, you can actually drop and drag pages around so they fall differently on your menu. Um, so if you want to reorganize things, whether it be alphabetical order or maybe you have a specific order you want to assign for your class, um, they can drop and drag pages around. It's not going to break links anywhere. You can see over here to the right of each page, um, there's this toggle on and off button. Oops. That's my homepage, can't turn it off. Um, but let's say your student's working on a page and they want to have the ability to edit that page, but maybe they don't want that page to be seen yet to the outside world. They can easily turn that off. It takes it out of the menu, but they still have the option to go in and edit that page. If you click on this gear icon for each page, you can do things like edit the page title. So maybe we want this to be called, oops, I'm sorry. Let's do edit page title. And let's do um, about me, right? So I can change the page name. I can also edit the page URL. I could duplicate the page. This is really helpful. Sometimes pages are just duplicates of each other. We can duplicate them and then just go in and change the content. I can add a page password. This is important for our students, I do believe. If they have a page, maybe they're not willing to share with the outside world, but they need you to see it to, create, um, to grade it, they can add a password. All right, you also can change your home page. So your home page is whatever page that shows up when someone goes to your URL, to your specific URL for your portfolio. So you can actually change the home page if you would like. Then you can also delete pages. All right, so let's talk about adding a page. If I want to add a page, I'm going to go back and show you again. I'm just going to click on pages and then I'm going to click on this plus sign here. <clears throat> so I told you that there's two types of pages for your portfolio that you can build. You can create single pages or collections. Now you're seeing a few more things that might be confusing, but basically the other things are additions that you can add to your menu, right? So they're not necessarily pages that you're going to build out. It's just additional items you can add to your menu. The first is this welcome page. Yes, I know it's called a page, um, but it's not actually a page. It's just going to be a landing space like this. Let me show you Alana's so this is her landing page, right? She has an image, you can add text and a link that goes into your website. So that is an option, but it's not required. It's just an addition to your site. Um, Lightroom is actually synced to portfolio. So if your student has a Lightroom account and they want to sync some galleries from Lightroom, they can do that. 
Again, we have the collection and then we have a link. You can link to an outside source if you would like to. I'm going to go back to this example and show you outside link. I have this link to OIT's website, so you can always add that if you would like. Let's go back. All right, so let's go ahead and just add a single page. I'm going to click page and then I'm going to title this research. Right, and then the destination is going to ask me, do I want to add it to the navigation or I do I want to add it to work? Now, as you can imagine, if I add this to work, it's going to fall under the umbrella of this work collections page. So it's going to be a sub page, right? So um, it would be a page that lives underneath work. I'm just going to add this to navigation and then I'm going to click create page. So now research has been added to my menu. All right, so that's how you add a page. Now let's talk about how you edit those pages. Super simple. You just click on whatever page you want to edit. So there's about me work. Let's click go to research. That's what we want to edit. And you're going to see this blank page container box. So your page container is where you're actually going to add content. And you can see all the different types of content you can add to these pages. First off, you can add an image. Let's just pick something. Right, you can add an image. And I do want to note that if you click here, you can actually add alt text. It's really important um, to make sure that all of your images have alternative text for accessibility purposes. But you can add a link so that image can link somewhere. You can also add a caption. You can replace your image later on or you can change the width and alignment. If I go down, let's say I want to add a new section. I'm going to click on this plus sign icon that appears here and then I can choose things like text, photo grid, video. I can easily embed a video or audio. I can also add a button. I want to show you how easy it is to add a button. So I clicked add button. I click on that button and then over here, this menu is going to be intuitive to whatever you're doing in this preview section. Um, so this edit button option shows up and I can do things like change the text here. And then link to an external URL or I can link to a page with within my portfolio and then I could use the URL there so I can do a couple of different things. I can also change the color if I wanted to. All kind of cool things, right? So I can add buttons. Um, I also can add a contact form if I want to. Again, all of these things. That's how you add content to a page. Super simple. Now let's go to this collection page because that was an individual page. <clears throat> let's talk about adding content to a collection page. So your collection page, you're not actually going to have text on it. Your collection page is just going to be a collection of images that link out to individual pages. Um, so you can have multiple collection pages if you would like. Again, I'm going to show you this example. So let's say meet the team. That goes to an individual page, right? Um, and as do these other pages. So let's go here and show you about um, creating a page for your collection. You can go to the collections page and you can click add page. You can add a page or a Lightroom. Um, I'm going to call this summer 2023 destination work. So I'm going to create that page. I did that a little differently. So I can actually for collection pages add them from the collection page or I could have still added it from here clicking this and then clicking page and assigning it destination work right so a couple of different ways you can add pages to a collection but let me go back to the summer 2023 because this is a sub page I have it set up where it's not showing up in the menu but we'll talk about that later when we talk about editing the look of our site this is summer 2023 I can do things again like add an image this image right then I can add text or whatever I want to for this page um, but I want to show you what happens when I add an image to this single page I'm going to go back to work because that's the collection this page lives under you can see that portfolio has taken my image and has actually added it as a cover photo for this page icon let me add a second page so we can talk about how to edit those images let's add a second page and let's call this um maybe spring 2023 all right destination work create page and let's say for this page we don't have an image we're just going to say this is text only 
All right. So you notice I don't have to save anything. It just auto saves. I'm going to go back to work. And I can see that this summer 2023 lives here, has an image, but this does not. Well, because portfolio is so intuitive, it goes ahead and tells me, hey, you don't have a cover page yet. Do you want to upload something? I could click on upload cover, but I'm going to show you a different way to do that. Anytime you're on a collection page and you need to add a cover, you just click on this page icon here um, and you can customize page covers. Excuse me, wrong thing. Edit cover image. I'm going to click on upload an image. Um, learn with us. OK. Now this image is here. Right. There's a couple other features you see where it says spring 2023, then it has the date. If I click on the page and I edit the page info, I can actually change things like the page title, which is actually going to change the page title. Um, but I can add a description. I can change the date. If I wanted to add some custom fields, like if I need to add a course number or something, I could do that. Or if I wanted to add keywords. Um, all right. So you notice that me adding that content doesn't show up here. Let me go back. So this is my main editing panel. This is my essentials site-wide, and this is for this collection, so it's specific for this page. I would go to this collection. I would click on page covers, and here you can see I can toggle on and off what's being shown underneath my page covers. Now, this is specific for this collection page. Um, again, let me show you really quickly. You would go here, you would edit page info, and then you would go back to your editing panel and turn those things on or off. I know I've had instructors that require very specific content like names, descriptions, course, or something like that. Um, so you can do all that there. That is how you edit a collection page. Does anyone have any questions so far? Let me check out the chat. OK, good. On the contact page, where does that data go or where is it stored? How do you access it? Um, so let's go back to about me. And on this contact form, if you click on customize, it's actually going to set you up. It's going to set up where these are going. So let's see. Form options. This is where my email is the email. It auto generates in this field, the email that you're using to create the portfolio, but you could change it if you wanted to. Um, and then form labels, you can turn those on or off form fields and then submit button. You can change that. And then there's a submitted message. So um, if you wanted to say, you know, thank you for submitting this contact form. I'll be in touch with you soon. If you have any other questions, feel free to call me, blah, blah. You can put all that there. But yeah. So let me do that one more time to show you. Just go to this contact form, click here and then click on customize. And then you have those options there. Great question. All right, perfect. All right, so we've talked about creating individual single pages. We've talked about setting up our collections page. Now let's spend a little bit of time on um, editing our portfolio so it looks, has a better look and appearance than just this generic gray that comes um, pre-stocked with whenever we choose our theme. All right, so if you notice, these blue icons are showing up throughout the website. Most of these blue icons, if you click on them, you're going to get the same editing options. If you were to go to this site wide editing features, click on header, um, the same options show up here. So just two different ways you can get to the same location. I tend to prefer to navigate to these through this site wide editing panel just just because that's my preference, um, but you can do it either way. So your header is actually this gray area in the background. Where you see your name, this is going to be auto generated from you logging into portfolio. This is actually your logo. We'll change that to an image. And then this is your navigation. So let's just go through this site wide editing. Let's click on header. First of all, I want to show you that again, you see these toggle options. You can turn all of these things on or off. This is a reoccurring theme you'll see throughout the, the portfolio, these, these toggle buttons. Let's click on header and let's edit our header. So really quickly, you can actually edit the width of your header if you would like. Um, you can maximize or minimize this space here. You can add an image to the background of your header. I would not necessarily suggest that just because it makes it a little less accessible for people to be able to read the text here. But if you wanted to upload an image for the entirety of the header, you could. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the background color. Today, I'm going to show you how to incorporate UA branding into your portfolio. Um, but know that it's not required. It's just whatever your preference is. So here, this background color right now is F3, F3, F3. Um, this is a color palette wheel. You can just 
you know, zoom around, pick whatever color you want, or you can use specific colors. I'm going to use what's called a hex color because I know what the UA hex color is. It is 9E1B32, and I'm going to press enter. Because portfolio is not like the people websites um, and doesn't come stocked with UA themes, I'm going to show you where you can actually go online to find the colors, download images, anything that you need related to the UA brand. If you are, in fact, interested in making your um, portfolio branded to UA theme. That website you're going to go to is a Stratcom website. And it's just called brand.ua.edu. You can click on brand standards. And there's something called a brand guideline. So if you open this up, it's going to give you all the information you know on the approved grays, reds, tans, anything that's related to color. You can actually find those color numbers there. And then this is also you, students can use this as well. Um, if you click on resources and downloads, logo and identifier library, you can actually download any of these logos straight from this website and put them onto your portfolio. So your students aren't having to steal things off of <laughs> offline um, or find the appropriate website. They can just download these in different formats and upload them to their portfolio. All right, so change the header to UA Red. I'm going to go back. The next thing I need to address is this logo. Right now it's my name. I don't want it to be my name. Um, so you see here, I have site name and logo. I can turn that on or off, but to edit, I would just click on the text. And then here I can change the text to read something else. Um, I can change where the text links to and the color, or I can make this an image. So I wanna make this an image. So I'm gonna click on image. I'm gonna upload an image and I've already pre-downloaded this UA Square logo. I'm gonna click on it and upload it. And now you can see this logo is now on my website. All right, so I can change the link in the alt text. I'm going to change this to be UA brand logo. Again, we always need to think about alt text. Um, and then link to, I want it to have no link. I don't want my logo to link to any other page on my website. So that is how you update that logo and the header background. Now let's talk about your navigation. So let's click here on navigation. <clears throat> There's a couple of different things you can do here. You see right now I have page titles and collection titles toggled on. Also have links. So if I were to create a page that was a personal link, it would show up here. But you can see sub pages is turned off. If I turn on sub pages, you can see all the pages that I've created are shown from my menu. But quite honestly, that just is too much because maybe I'll have six pages for a collection. Um, so I'm going to turn that off so those sub pages aren't visible unless I go to that collection page. Um, but it's, for instance, if you wanted to turn off anything, you could. So all single pages are off. You can just play with that. If you wanted to edit what page titles look like or collection titles in your menu, you would need to click on page titles. And then I could go in and actually change the text to Arial and the size. So all this is completely custom. Um, but again, you have to do those for each, you know, each type of page. 18. I can also change the color. Um, then I would go to collection titles and I would change it to the same thing. Arial 18. Um, so you see that this color is a little different. Um, we have what we call rollover in active colors. So if your regular colors is gray, active could be, I don't know, blue. It doesn't look the best. But so people know what link they're actually on or what page they're actually on an active link. So that's your navigation. We also have the footer here. So you can see at the bottom right now, the footer is just this generic powered by Adobe portfolio. We can change that and probably should change it. So I'm going to click on footer and click on footer, and then I can include any text here in my footer. Um, now you can't actually, it's, you can link text, but you have to use some HTML and our office can actually help you if you wanted to create um, something like this for your footer where it links out, we can help you build that. Um, but you could also just have, you know, this is my portfolio or Powered by the University of Alabama, something there. But you can change the fonts and things for your, for your footer. I'm going to go back and show you social icons. If you turn on social icons, your students can actually link to their Twitter, or maybe this is going to be a organization Twitter or LinkedIn. So all they have to do is add the URLs, the unique URLs for all of these um, sites, and then they'll turn on those um, icons, and then the icons for all of their socials will show up here at the bottom of the page. 
All right, so that is basically how you edit the look of the website. There are a lot more details that we could dive into. For instance, you can change the padding in between each of these and change the number of pages that appear in rows and columns. But um, because of time, we're not going to do that. But I want to see if anyone has any questions so far. Nope. OK. All right. So these can be completely custom. I do want to go through some of these essentials just so you can see some other options. Integrations, we don't really use that much, but you can integrate um, other tools like Stock, Lightroom, and Behance. All right. Well, let's talk about themes. Let's say you want to switch the theme. I want to show you how intuitive and how special Adobe Portfolio is. So even if I wanted to change the theme to, let's say this one. Changing the theme does not ruin any of your links or any of your work. You can change the theme as many times as you want to see what you like if you're not assigning a theme for your students. I um, you can see I changed the theme here. You know, everything looks different, but all my links and all of the pages and everything are still here. Let's go back to themes. I'm going to change it back to this Mercedes theme. All right, so you see my theme is all there. Now let's go to settings. So before you publish your site, it's always important, I think, to look at your settings. And there's a couple of things here that might be important for your students, and it might not be. Um, the first is home page. So I showed you earlier how you can change the home page under pages. But if you want to, you can always change the home page here to a different page. Pick any page in your site. Analytics, students actually can pull in Google Analytics if they want to set up a Google Analytics tracking page for this website. They can, they can see how many people are accessing their page. Search optimization, if students want their site to be searched and maybe fall higher in a search um, on Google, let's say, or Edge or Safari, they can actually add metadata and meta keywords. And then it always is auto-selected to have search engines index my site. On the other hand, if you have a student who's like, oh, I'm not so sure, I want my site to necessarily show up in search engines, um, they can have automatically, oops, they can turn both of these features off, which means sites like Google aren't going to crawl their site and um, categorize it in a search option. It will be live, anyone can still find it, but it's not necessarily going to move up in searches if someone searches for their names. So it's going to have custom meta tags. Again, that's for search engine optimization. A favicon, so if a student wants to add an image that shows up here, like you see this image here and this image here, they can actually upload a custom image, um, whatever their preference is. Social sharing, site options. All right, so these are all pretty standard. I would say just leave those as is. And then password protection. So we talked about password protecting individual pages, which I think is smart if a student's not comfortable sharing maybe a journaling page or something that you're requiring in the classroom. Um, but if students want their entire site's password protected, they can click on this password protect whole website and then type in their password that they would then need to share with you. Or maybe you could assign them a password if that's what you're most comfortable with. And then anytime someone uses their URL, no matter if it's linked or someone finds it, um, you know, anywhere, let's say on Facebook or social media site, you'd have to have a password to get into that site. All right, and then let's talk about restore website style. So I'm guilty of this. We have not published this site, but let's say I was up really late one night and I actually published my site and I hated it. It was awful. Um, students are able to restore their website to the last published style. So it's the last published job, not the last edits they made, but the last time it was published. This is super helpful because, like I said, I've really messed up my site before trying to change something, um, but they can restore website styles. So that is oh, also domain name. Um, so your site domain always comes with a dot myportfolio.com unless you purchase a domain or you have your own domain. But here I can actually change this. So let's say this is for research. Let's say we want to call it. Victoria Research 2023. Um, I can apply that. And as long as that was available, my six, my domain was successfully successfully set. So it's a little more customizable than what Adobe signed, assigned to me. So I'm going to click done. So that's basically all the essentials that you would need to know about to help your students get started with their website. But now that we have everything that it looks beautiful, you know, this is 
the most fabulous site I've ever created, and I'm ready to publish. All I have to do is click Publish Site. One moment. And then you see my URL here. I can view my site, and now my site is live and can be shared with the world or with my instructor only. Super, super simple, guys. Um, all right, so let's go back to the main Adobe Portfolio site. So once your site is published, um, you will see it show up as published here. For example, this is a draft. It's not been published, and I can have up to five sites. All I would need to do to edit this site is go back to portfolio.adobe.com. I would need to sign in, and then I would just click on Edit Site. I would have the ability to then go in and add content. Maybe later, we talked um, earlier, I spoke about how an instructor required their students to have a portfolio published at the beginning of the semester, even though there was no content on that site. So she knew that they had the site up and running to, to then later add content. Um, this is where your students would do that. They would go back to portfolio, click edit site, and then they would edit their site you know, as needed or as they gathered that the content information that, be, that needed to be posted. Um, there. And then once they make edits, they would just do update live site. That site would be updated and then it's live again for you to see. All right, so we have about 10 minutes left for questions at the end. I'm hoping you have questions. Um, if not, that's OK. Maybe I did a great job of explaining everything, um, but I would just love to hear from you if there's anything that you are not sure about or maybe you have questions on how to incorporate this into your classroom or even suggestions on how you think you could incorporate it. Yeah, it is. It is really simple. And I'll tell you an example. Um, this the, the instructor who allowed me to use their syllabus, we had set up a. Um, first week of class, we had worked with them to set up a virtual uh, workshop for their students and all of the students attended and most of these students were virtual students. Um, so all the students attended and they asked questions. We went over how to build their portfolio and then she was a little concerned. So she wanted halfway through the semester for us to have a um, like 30 minute question answer that I was available virtually for students to come in and ask questions. And we had two students show up and, and, and they were just there because they felt they had to be there. So none of the students had issues um, that they couldn't address. And then when they did, they just submitted tickets to the IT service desk. So, um, and maybe I didn't explain that right. So yes, the site is searchable. So anytime you're creating a Adobe portfolio, once it hits live, that site's you know live on the internet, like live on the web. Um, there's ways to make it more searchable. As in, if you're on Google and you typed in Victoria's research, I could add keywords to my site, so my site fell higher in that index of search listings, like on a Google search. Um, but I could turn off those options that I showed you where that site was not being crawled by Google, therefore it would not show up in any search results. Um, that means pages in this site in its entirety, right? Um, so let me give you, let me show you an example. Um, what I'm talking about, like if I search oit.ua.edu, well, it's straight to the, let's go to google.com, I'm sorry. I'm not sharing my screen, so you can't see it. That is not helpful. Let me share my screen. Yep, I'm sharing. Okay, so if you go to google.com and you search for cit.ua.edu, you can see the Center for Instructional Technology shows up first in this search, search listings here on Google. If I turn off, if I go to settings and I go to site option, nope, um, search optimization. If I turn off this allow search and just index my site, that means that Google and other sites aren't going to index it and it should not show up here in a search like if someone searched for Victoria Collins or Victoria Research. Now if I did want my site to show up there, I would need to make sure this option was selected and then I could even add some extra keywords um, so it helped my site fall higher in that search. But yeah, some of our students don't want their sites to show up in search engine searches. Yep. Yep. 
Yep, this is awesome. And of course, we would love to hear from you if you're using this in your course or in the classroom and it was a success. I would love for you to get back in contact with me so I can share um, some of the practices that you use with other instructors so we can um, you know, help other people use this tool in the classroom successfully. But that is all I have for today. I thank you so much for coming. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'll leave my email here and know that the um, OIT service desk is always there to help. So you can always email them with questions. They'll be rerouted to us in the Center for Instructional Technology. But other than that, thank you so much. I appreciate both of you coming today.